Hello, everyone, and welcome to Demon Lives, The Cult of WeWork, a conversation with The Wall Street Journal's Maureen Farrell and Elliot Brown. I'm Scott McCartney, Duke Class of 1982 and columnist for The Wall Street Journal, also adjunct instructor of journalism and public policy at the DeWitt Wallace Center for Media and Democracy and co-chair of Duke Student Publishing Company's board. Before we begin, I want to thank this episode's co-sponsors, The Chronicle, the DeWitt Wallace Center for Media and Democracy, and Demon New York. Please note that we are recording this Zoom session to stream later on Demon Live. And please post your audience questions for the panelists in the Q&A feature of the webinar. You'll see it at the bottom of the screen, not the chat feature, but the Q&A feature. And now it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's panelists, co-authors of the recently published book, The Cult of We, we Work, Adam Newman, and The Great Startup Delusion. Their full bios are on the Demon Live episode page. Maureen Farrell, who graduated from Duke in 2001, is now a reporter at the New York Times, a former reporter at the Wall Street Journal, and former Chronicle staffer. And Elliot Brown, reporter at the Wall Street Journal, and for tonight, an honorary Dukey. <laughs> Maureen and Elliot, as I think all of you know, broke some incredible award-winning stories about WeWork founder, Adam Newman. And now they have produced a fantastic book that really puts readers in the rooms and the airplanes where it happened. The New York Times called it a juicy guided tour. And I think that's really what we're gonna get tonight, a juicy guided tour through one of the most incredible corporate scandals of our time. So I wanna start with a question about Adam Newman himself. It seems to me that his massive spending on himself his lust to take and take and take right from the start sets him apart in the in the annals of corporate swindlers. Um, do, did you come to believe that ego drove him or was it adrenaline or was it greed? How, how do you regard him? I think it was a little bit of all of this. And I think you're exactly right. I mean, even uh, things are getting a little crazier and crazier in Silicon Valley in particular, but I mean, his, the level of excess of Adam Newman as a founder and CEO of a private company was sort of unlike things that other investors had ever seen. But it, I mean, there's narcissism, there's ego, but it was also, you know, it, it started out like that. I mean, he wanted to sort of, he had, this, he had this vision. He wanted to take over the world with WeWork, but he also thought he was the person to do it. And as time went on, I mean, he thought he was gonna um, solve Middle East peace. He thought he should be president of the world. It got, his ego kind of got bigger and bigger, but the incredible thing is kind of everyone, there were a lot of people around him um, not even not questioning it, but, you know, saying, you know, it's just so many people saying you are that amazing. You could do anything. So throughout the story, there were these really savvy investors spending unbelievable sums of other people's money and they got completely hoodwinked. Do you think they were just seduced by Adam Newman or seduced by their own egos that told them that they were smarter than everybody else. Um, why, why did they fall so badly for this? Yeah, I think, I mean, that, that was one of the central questions that you, we're finance reporters, uh, we're, we're interested in sort of following the money. And that was one of the central questions from the beginning, where it was just, how can smart people, and these were legitimately smart people, do something so stupid, uh, you know, so as to see a... Uh, kind of mid-sized real estate company as literally the country's most valuable startup. And so, um, you know, what we saw was basically a lot of confirmation bias and looking and running as a herd to the point where Adam would meet with these guys and then really seduce them to, to your point. And, and, and uh, you know, someone would come in expecting someone in a suit and there, Adam would be plying him at 10 a.m. with shots of tequila uh, and sort of loosening him up, um, almost always a him. And then they, the, the, there was a mutual fund manager that did this, but other people did it too. He then said, this is a great investment, goes back to his analysts who say, this is a real estate company. It's not worth anything close to what he's asking. We shouldn't do this investment. And then in the end, the mutual fund does the investment uh, because the, you know the, there was this personal connection and this guy saw all these other investors who had already been in there. Uh, and so that's sort of this dangerous brew that, that, that continues. Yeah. So that herd, herd mentality, as we work grows, it, it, it spread, right? It wasn't just among investors, it was among reporters. 
Um, it was, you know, and, and you talk about how it was, it was part of a startup bubble. Um, you, you talk about other bubbles in history, Holland Tulips, um, Beanie Babies, I was guilty of that one, uh, <laughs> the tech bubble, the subprime lending crisis. Um, do you, as you look back on this, um, was it was it just one more bubble, or was there something more to it? And and as part of that, how complicit do you think the media was with all the fawning, uncritical coverage of this? Sure, I mean there, it, the bubble was was a big part of it. I mean, it seemed like most investors were looking, really looking for Adam Newman, essentially. I mean, he was coming to them, pitching this, they were looking for these kind of crazy eccentric founders who were going to take over the world and have this, this limitless vision. And he, he created this picture for them that, you know, it was in this world of FOMO that they, everyone wanted in on the next Amazon, the next Facebook as early as possible. And he knew how to sort of paint that picture. It was somewhat intuitive, he, he learned how to speak the language of exactly what people wanted WeWork to be, which was not a real estate company from the very beginning. And maybe I'll start a little bit with the media and maybe Elliot, you wanna jump in. Um, but yes, the media was completely um, complicit in it. I mean, the media also wanted, uh, you know, an Adam Newman to grace the cover of their magazine. And I, I, I once worked at Forbes, it's a great publication, but. I mean, he was, you know, on the cover of Forbes, I think two different times. He was all over the media. And I mean, he just had an incredible story. And for the most part, no one was sort, sort of un looking underneath the hood at some of the things that just didn't add up. And um, I'll, I'll give a, a, one a point to Elliot. I mean, he came to the story very early before I got in on it and was one of the few reporters at the Wall Street Journal just sort of questioning the valuation of the company. He was hearing a lot of some of the crazy things Adam was doing early on. And what I'll say is when we were reporting the book, one thing that we sort of were amused by or uh, was just how obsessed Adam Newman was with Elliot, almost as much as Elliot was intrigued by the story because he could not believe that someone didn't believe the whole mystique of WeWork and him and that like, that a, a reporter would dare ask these questions of WeWork um, and other people underneath him. But Adam was very fixated on this, uh, this whole thing. Overly so, perhaps. <laughs> uh, yeah. I, I, just briefly on the media environment, I was, I was covering real estate at first and then switched to covering venture capital. And one of the things that was just driving me insane back in the 2015, 2014 era was you'd read all this coverage in Silicon Valley from essentially the tech press, TechCrunch, Forbes, Fast Company, and they would all just be buying these startup stories and taking them as though they were true. Uh, when when really all these startups were selling was like, we might in the future disrupt this enterprise or like this business, but we haven't done it yet. We're just, we only have like this tiny sliver, but the press would write about it like it was here um, as the startup founders would sell it to investors. So um, I found that maddening as opposed to people writing about like this company loses $2 for every dollar it takes in, or this company subsidizes your, your car ride across San Francisco. That's why you paid $4 for it. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> so, so Elliot, talk about his obsession with, with you. Uh, was, was it, did he think you were just nuts or did he think you were a smart guy that he needed to win over? I think it was it was a couple of things. I think basically somebody must have told Adam or or he realized like the Wall Street Journal is important for me getting funders and like the thing I like the most is getting more funding. Uh, and so I think that that I was the only one at the journal covering them um, for a long time was and my coverage was usually like this looks like a real estate company and has, uh, you know, yet has a tech valuation. Um, I think that that was annoying to them. Um, but did, every th that said, every time I'd write, they they would you know a story like that. They they would raise more money at a higher valuation. Uh, so it, it it wasn't that troublesome for them for a while. But then toward the toward the end, uh, you know, we can get to this. But then there started to be, and this is where Maureen and I started partnering some um, more stories on conflicts of interest and and sort of bad behavior beyond just the business model. Uh, that that particularly irked them. So so in the reporting of this, was there a particular tip or an event or something that 
sort of moved you into hyperspeed or? It, it, it was it was more gradual like I, I you know because I started I met them in 2013 and then um, as I was just like oh you're writing about the office market and they were this emerging company uh, and then there was a, a little flavor of it then when they insisted to me we are not a real estate company and you're a real estate reporter why are you here uh, and so I thought that was odd and, and then found out their valuation and that was sort of a light bulb going off like oh they need to say they're not a real estate company so they can have this high valuation and uh, I think just as things sort of layered on, like I started to learn how we like private jets early on when he was renting them. And then, you know, th then people around the newsroom, including Maureen, would start to hear random tips about just like, the, I heard this guy who talked to this guy, Adam, and he was really chatty at this dinner saying how he was going to be really rich and like, you know, stuff like that would just sort of add up. And then it just sort of became more and more the, the apotheosis of every concerning trend in Silicon Valley. Mm. Yeah. And you guys were a big part of the story, obviously, um, but you pretty much leave yourselves out of the narrative of the book, which I thought was really interesting. You refer to your story simply as the Wall Street Journal reported. Um, so we don't we don't get much of the backstory. Um, I, I'm I'm curious how much was there. Um, we have seen in other scandals, uh, Theranos, for example. Um, where companies just go completely nuclear and start having investigators following reporters and going through their trash and, and all that. Was, was there any of that? Or um, uh, what, what was the, the WeWork campaign against you like? And, and why not have that in, in the book? We had written some of it in and um... I think some people, some, we had a lot of very uh, great readers who were generous with their time and were like, eh, I don't know if it like, if it breaks up the narrative too much. So it, it was sort of a decision that I, it kind of came down to that. Um, but I mean, I think they were, besides the sort of fixation, the Adam's fixation on certain people um, with Elliot, I mean, it was just more, it was a little bit like they were, there was some aspect of them, uh, you know, trying to divide and conquer, like get to me, I was covering IPOs um, at the time in capital markets and like, maybe they can win me over. Maybe I'm not gonna like look at the numbers or get it in the same way and sort of divide us up. And yeah, I mean, it was, it was a little more typical, I would say, than, you know, what John Kerry Rue went through at Theranos when they were like really coming after him. I mean, they were, they were pushing back on stories. I mean, there was one in particular um, over the summer that before the uh, IPO was starting to happen in September of 2019. That's when they thought they would go public. And we had heard that Adam had essentially taken out between loans and stock sales, roughly a billion dollars. And I mean, that became, I and mean, they were so flipped out about that story and their questions of the veracity of some of the pushback and everything. We sort of put a lower number in, um, but it was a little bit more of a traditional like push and pull with the company and Adam. And, um, but I mean, as it got closer to the IPO, maybe Ellie, you want to talk more about that too. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, you know, part of it, I, th I think is that, that, that we weren't as quite as an exciting part of, of the narrative <laughs> or maybe a little boring. Um, but then, yeah, the one thing that we did have in that, that um, in a sort of longer section that it just sort of broke up the flow of the book. So we took it out was uh, sort of the story of, of the, the story I ended up writing uh, right before the IPO came, which was a profile of Adam that, that um, was sort of particularly well-timed. Uh, that had just like, it was about sort of how, how erratic and crazy he was uh, at, at the very time that the, the company was on the precipice. Um, and that sort of was the, ended up being the straw that broke the camel's back uh, and, and got him kick, kicked out. And eventually sort of, they pulled the IPO and then, then it got, got him kicked out. Um, I guess the reason we, we, we did struggle to be like, well, how much should we play that up? And I think both of us have the sense of, um, you know, we wanted people to know that it was part of it, but we didn't also want to make this a book about like how the Wall Street Journal reporters took down Adam Newman, because that, that's not really what happened. I mean, that 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 was a thing that happened at the end in a bit, but like the bigger issue was that the market bought it and then the market turned against him um, and, and the press played a role, but not sort of the, the leading role. 
Yeah. So um, one th one thing to add there, and I don't think we put this in the I don't think we put this in the book at all. I mean, just one moment I think that stands out for both of us is Elliot's story was published, and I mean the the lead anecdote essentially was that Adam had flown with many friends to Israel on a rented private jet before they bought their jet. And they had been smoking marijuana th the whole time and stuffed it into a cereal box when they arrived there. And it was found by the crew and the jet had to be taken out of commission. It was uh, a completely wild story. But um, right after, after it was published a day or two later, someone, a high level banker um, called me and said, I read the story and the IPO was about to go in theory a couple of days later. Um, he said this not only will there not be an ipo out of because of that story and specifically because of that anecdote it's a it's a felony to take drugs on the international flight no one no bank can stand behind adam newman anymore no one can buy the ipo he will be out within 48 hours and it's like it was unfathomable i called elliot as soon as we hung up um and said that and we both were like no uh, what a crazy <laughs> thing and he wasn't out within 24 hours, but the coup started basically. The board coup started within 48 hours, pretty much. So, so he went from crazy guy with a with a dream to international drug smuggler. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's there's really amazing reporting in this book. Um, I just loved it. I mean, you you take us into every meeting, every plane ride, as as you just talked about conversations with some of the top people in finance around the world and, and really break a lot of the complicated financial dealings into understandable tales. Um, but what I, what I most loved were the amazing small details sprinkled liberally throughout. Um, details about his petulance, his self-dealing, his eight homes, and, and some amazing color, like he orders espresso with clarified butter. Who, who does that? Um, the, the 1970s real estate entrepreneur who's now doing card tricks on America's Got Talent. I mean, I, I just couldn't stop laughing. And, and, and of course, the pot stashed in the cereal box. Um, talk about how you got that kind of detail and, and worked it into the, into the narrative. Were people just really talkative about this? Or how did it come about? Uh, yeah, do you want to go ahead? Sure, I'll start. Um, it, I mean, it was just in part of it's just fun. Like, I mean, you know, the, 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 this uh, we we I often like to say that that Adam Newman is God's gift to journalism. I mean, he would just like leave this trail of of anecdotes everywhere he went, and everyone you talked to, you'd say they they'd have a story. And so part of it was just having fun talking to these people. I mean, like. I'm sorry, which home was this? Was this his seventh home, his eighth home? And like, is there really a room shaped like a guitar? Uh, and, you know, then like, you know, uh, then when people were angry at him, they, about him, they, they, they say all sorts of things like, oh God, he would just come in to, uh, we'd be at lunchtime at a meeting and everyone was sitting there for hours with our stomachs growling and then he'd get served lunch and then he'd lick the plate clean. Uh, while we all sat there watching. Um, so like, I mean, part of it was just sort of the organic things that happen when it comes out. On the, on the other hand, I, like at least I was taught, taught sort of in journalism, um, always write about the food um, because uh, it just gives people a, a real something any, anyone can relate to. So that was one sort of thing I heard hollowing um, in, 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 jumping around, echoing in my mind. But yeah, Maureen. Oh, I, and I was gonna say that it was interesting with the pandemic. I think at the, we both started our book leave like weeks after the pandemic, um, you know, was in full swing and um, weeks beforehand, Elliot had moved to New York. Um, we thought we would be meeting, sort you know, in order to talk to sources in person. So at first it was really, um, I, I thought we'd travel, maybe we'd go to Israel, look at where, you know, see where he was born, meet his, uh, you know, people he knew from his childhood. And then obviously the world was shut down. And at first it was really scary um, to think about how we're gonna do our reporting. And it was, it was very odd, but I think it, it really worked to our benefit. I think just people had a lot, you know, we were all just like very reflective at that time. And people had a lot of time in their hands. They were home and bored. <laughs> and like people who may have otherwise maybe had a little time for us had like, hours and hours and hours and 
<laughs> um, yeah, over the course of time, I think we were just shocked by the how open people were at all levels and, um, you know, just how much time they wanted to give us and how, you know, a lot of different people for all different reasons just really wanted the story told the right way. So we were, I think, you know, we felt very incredibly grateful for all the time that people gave us. I know you guys work incredibly well together. Um, I also know that writing a book with a partner can be really difficult. Um, first book I did was with a partner and you got to divide up work. You got to come to agreement on how things should be written and, and all that. How, how did you tackle that challenge? Um, it, it was, uh, I, I don't know, it must be something in the water at Duke because Maureen is like incredibly easygoing and, and good writing partner. It was um, I mean, it, you know, one issue is like we, the story arc was, was a pretty clear one to both of us. And we were very aligned early on. Like we want this to be a story about not just we work, but like global finance and sort of the craziness out there. Uh, and then just sort of mechanically, I mean, we would talk uh, constantly <laughs> a lot. Um, we would work in Google Docs and oftentimes we'd be working in the same doc or, or watching the other person interview someone because you could see them. <laughs> sort of typing the, the the transcript as they were doing it. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, that's sort of the, the, the basic outline of it. Um, I'm sure there's other fun stuff. And it, it worked nicely. I mean, we had we had different areas of coverage. Elliot had covered real estate, had knew the company very early on, was covering venture capital in San Francisco from the last few years. I'd cover the IPO markets, banking. I'd really focused on SoftBank. Um, so it was almost as we were writing our chapters, it was it was sort of easy to figure out who would write each one, and then we, you know then we went back and forth with a lot a lot and um, edited each other and rewrote things. But um, yeah, the dividing and conquering was nice. And I've heard from other journalists, even going into this, that it can be like a really lonely process. And um, it was just, I mean, it was so much fun. We were, every day we'd call each other also, just being like, you will never believe what we just, like each one of us would have something that was like the most shocking thing we've ever heard, sometimes multiple times a day. <laughs> Which you wouldn't think would happen, you know, months into having reported this after years of, of reporting on WeWork, you'd think we'd have exhausted the, the uh, you know, ability to get like surprised by something. But uh, no, we, we continually would find th new things that would surprise us anew. Have there been any surprises since the book came out? <laughs> a couple. <laughs> There's a paperback edition coming out. There's yeah. A few things that were like we can, I cannot believe I'm just now. <laughs> Anything you can share with us? Uh, I think we're gonna have to stay tuned for those. <laughs> okay. All right. So um, towards the end of the book, you remind us of some of the very similar spectacular rises and falls. Um, electric truck maker Nikola, for example. Um, and, and by the way, the whole spec craze. Um, have we learned nothing? <laughs> um, the short answer is no, uh, we, 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 or yes, we have learned nothing. Um, okay. No, we haven't learned anything. Um, I think uh, it was really surprising to us because when when we started the book, which was the end of 2019, if you looked at the the landscape out here in Silicon Valley, um, things had really changed. Uh, like there was this icy chill that had, or icy cloud that had descended upon the, the fundraising market for these types of companies. And people realized, we're saying things like, wow, you really do need a path to profitability, which is like, well, yeah, that's what a business is. Um, but uh, they, they were saying that and they said, maybe we shouldn't give founders all sorts of control and, and valuation started to fall. And then uh, you know, then you fast forward to the pandemic and um, that uh, sort of like at first we were like, wow, everything's going to go out of business. Um, and then, you know, a month later, uh, it just sort of went went the other way. I, I don't know. Yeah. Maureen, do you want to sort of take through the what we did after there? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was it was just kind of unbelievable. Just like the pendulum. There was this wake up call. And I mean, at the, the end of the book, basically, I mean, one of the big pieces of the book is why we work out as big as it did um, was because, at, especially at the end, was there was SoftBank, is this conglomerate in Japan, and they had raised fifty, they had raised 
50 billion dollars and from saudi arabia built one of the biggest tech for uh investing funds of all time 100 billion dollars and after we he masayoshi son the ceo of softbank was on the brink of raising another 100 billion dollars and then WeWork's implosion caused all these uh, different people to like be, you know, nation states and others to be really wary of giving him money again. So, I mean, that felt like just such a huge thing in the book. I mean, we really heard that, um, you know, in meetings, people were in meetings and about to like sign a check to him and then said, wow, look at WeWork, you put 10 billion or whatever, like some a huge, I can't remember if it was 10 billion at that, moment, but a huge amount of money into this company and look what happened and you sort of enabled this founder. And anyway, so that, I mean that, and so many other things were feeling very significant. And yes, it just seems like sadly, I mean, we rewrote the epilogue so many times. It does feel like not that much has been learned and we're seeing more crazy founders, you know, maybe not quite anyone on the level of Adam Newman, but, um, people taking out tons of money, things that are just red flags, taking out money, selling stock before your companies go public, before other investors can. All the things that were obvious red flags with Adam Newman is just happening again. And, and this FOMO, this whole fear of missing out does seem to still be like dictating how people think about investing. Hmm. Um, this is really not just a story about WeWork. And, and Adam Newman. It's really, um, as, as you said before, Elliot, it's a story about corporate greed. Um, and it's really a story about the frailties of, of human nature. It's about ego and insecurity and envy. And it, it's really the seven deadly sins, isn't it? <laughs> did, did you find that, that it, was, um, it was much more about human nature than, than simply greed? Uh, yeah, I, I, at least personally, like that was one thing I didn't expect to sort of learn from the book process. But um, I, I you know, already sort of came in a cynic, uh, but, but I think left, um, I guess, with this impression that that humans are just much more malleable and, and can sort of rationalize anything to themselves uh, the, 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 than, than I thought beforehand. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, it's that the, 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 there's also like there's no real protagonist in our book. Um, it, it, it's a lot of antagonists, um, and so that's not a uh, uh, like. Th there's obviously we don't write about the cheery things, but um, <laughs> th this was full of a lot of sort of revealing concepts about you know greed and and, and ego. To your point, and like I personally hadn't even. In, it, believed in the concept of greed beforehand. I sort of just thought that's what you do in capitalism. You, everyone pushes for, for what they can get, but, but this guy really showed me that there's a whole different level of what's sort of the norm and acceptable and, and what you really can push for, uh, for, for your own benefit. Mm -hmm. And then in just in terms of the whole like broader ecosystem, like when you think about, it's like, yes, Adam Newman was incredibly greedy. He was incredibly visionary but did a lot of crazy things, but there were all these, like some of the top people in finance were the ones signing off, you know, his board, it was a very high caliber board um, who knew finance, who knew, and I, it was, whether it was the board and in different ways, bankers around him. I mean, it was senior people at JP Morgan and Goldman Sachs. And the fact, you know, it's greed in sort of a different way. It's like fear of, you know, this, there's going to be this hundred million dollar pot of fees at the end of this IPO. So if we like, why stand up to Adam Newman too much, even if it's going to be dangerous to the company and dangerous to investors, if we could just, you know, if we just keep it going and get to the finish line, we will get our fees and, you know, say la vie. Um, so I think that, yeah, that was just the, a depressing thing at each step of the way. And I think, the moments at which you saw people stand up to him. I mean, it was unbelievable how late in the game and it was after it was done. You know, people are only really willing to stand up and push back when there was, you know, it was way too late by then. And, and you mentioned JP Morgan and, and, um, um, and Goldman, you know, it was Fidelity. It was uh, other mutual fund companies. I, I mean, that was, to me, that was one of the horrifying thing was, the, the people who we trust to manage our retirement savings and all, and they, and, and they were ignoring 
analyst, you know, assessments of the numbers and, and everything like that, and throwing huge amounts of money at this guy. Mm-hmm. And yeah, so- I, yeah, I, I think that I thought at least there wouldn't, that, that people who manage that much money had more checks on them. Um, yeah. but they're, they're, they're really just like us. And, <laughs> um, and it was just so much more of a reckless system, for, you know, finan- whole financial system that, that, than I was aware of. Yeah. Yeah. In the epilogue, you write, um, society is easily wooed by a charismatic leader who has a big vision. Um, it's hard to resist an optimist who promises a lucrative future. And I was struck that that, that was in relation to Trevor Milton, the founder of, of Nikola. Um, it could have been Donald Trump or it could have been many others, right? How, coming out of this, how does, how do you think society should combat that charisma or protect ourselves from the, the charlatans? It's interesting. I mean, there, you know, when people sort of, when we've talked or like people have asked about regulation, like that, you know, say something in the private, I mean, and your, I think your question is a good one that it is so much more broad, whether it, yeah, it's a Donald Trump or, you know, whether it's a business leader or someone in politics, um, all these people who are sort of wooing the world and shaping it, um, you know, potentially in scary ways and, uh, and have just, uh, accumulating so much power, but, um, the right, in terms of just the private markets and what checks could have been put on Adam Newman, it's, that's just a, an interesting question. Cause I don't think there's an easy answer to that. Like what could do to stop him? I mean, it's just really people doing their job and standing up and, um, you know, the checks and balances that should be in there being there, like a board of directors that has like a backbone and can stand up to a leader. And I don't know, I feel like there's just no easy answer to this, of like how, how we stop these uh, figures or, or have a little like sanity around them. Yeah, other than teach better critical thinking skills. Uh, I, I mean, like a lot of these things are usually, well, there's 25 reasons why this isn't a tech company, but here's this one. And then, you know, you just like look at, at the one as opposed to like saying, well, maybe it loses $2 for every dollar it takes in or spends, to, yeah, like m- maybe that's a reason it's not a good software company. Uh, but but if you're just wooed by the one thing, it's it's easy to stay fixed on that and 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 sort of forget the rest. And, and and so, um, you know, part of that, that's, that's what we in the media are here for, but uh, individuals are, are, are responsible too. We, we've sort of forgotten the, uh, if, if it's too good to be true, it probably is, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, um, so let's talk about um, journalism and, and publishing. Um, we have Duke students on, on the call tonight. Um, any tips for Duke students and alums in the audience who are trying to get their foot in the door in journalism or creative writing or publishing? Sure. I mean, I guess just very broadly speaking, I mean, it's such it's a tricky it's such a tricky path to start um, on. I would say, especially just coming right out of school. I mean, you see so many of your classmates have jobs right out of school and a path to follow and. Um, and journalism is just a tricky one. I mean, people get their foot in the door in so many different ways. So there's some level of sort of flexibility, um, being w- willing to kind of pivot and, you know, just take the first shot you get and learn from there. I mean, I had no, in, no knowledge of business. I'd never really taken an econ class at Duke. Um, and my first job just happened to be covering mergers and I had to Google what a, what a merger was like on the way to the interview. And somehow I, I kind of stumbled into business journalism and have loved it and really see it as a way of kind of understanding the broader world. It's been so much fun, but I think, you know, you, you have to learn as you go and be willing to be flexible and take what you can get and then build that into your career. Yeah, I think just watching people, um, if if you if you do find a sort of initial way in, I, I, I'm far too removed from that to, to know what's a good idea these days. But people do good journalists get get better jobs if if they're at a bad job. Uh, like you you like you can one of the nice things about this trade is is 
you do write words and those words get published for everyone to see. And, and so if, if uh, you're doing a good job then other people can see that, your competitors can see that, your friends can see that. And uh, it, it like, yeah, so it's not a beautiful, complete meritocracy, but uh, good work gets ahead. And and let's talk about um, the book publishing business a little bit. So how how did you get from writing articles um, to creating a book? We had kind of a crazy, um, really uh, speedy process, basically. I mean, Elliot, I think have been, have been thinking. Um, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but about you know we work as like that. This would be an amazing book at some point before the sort of rapid denouement of the company and Adam Newman's uh, time as CEO. But basically in like the week, it was September 2019 when the IPO was supposed to be happening. And um, it was just the craziest time ever in my career reporting. I mean, we were, there were just stories. It was just very nonstop. Every story that was breaking in real time about this all the crazy things happening with the IPO and crazy things happening with the company. So it was kind of around the clock. We were talking, working on stories. And um, we just started talking about, oh, what would a book look like if we wrote it together? You know, what would we both think we'd want it to be? And I, you can correct me on this, um, Elliot, but I think it was like a Friday. We, we sort of we talked about this, worked all weekend on stories. And it might've been when, I think it was when he was getting pushed out, but came up with kind of like two paragraphs of what we thought this might be. And by like two, the following Tuesday, we had a preemptive offer. Elliot had been talking to an agent um, who's a, an amazing agent. And then this, our, who was our publisher came in. So we didn't have, we didn't do it the normal way. It was just such a hot topic in the media that there was sort of immediate interest and we were also told, and we've seen this subsequently, that um, if you guys don't get this done quickly, the, you know, 10 other people will pitch books. It's kind of an interesting time in um, book publishing land with hot stories right now. The, the, the Tuesday that the offer came in, so it was Adam Newman resigned as CEO at uh, 11 a.m. Yeah, Pacific or so. Uh, like we had that story and then it was like 4 p.m. that uh, we get the the email or text uh, that, that the offer come. I mean, it, it was in pro like, you know, we didn't talk about it a little before, but it's like and this was, again, to Maureen's point, like to write book on WeWork, no further instruction. <laughs> <laughs> that was your proposal, huh? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. So, um uh, a couple questions from the audience ab about um, uh, WeWork itself and the office market. Um, as, as companies grapple with how and when to send employees back to offices, um, what do you think about the future? What do you think the future of work is going to look like? And, and also, um, what can you say about the validity of WeWork's core business model itself? Um, we can both take this and we'll probably have different takes on it. <laughs> um, I mean, I think it's like a lot is left to be written and understood. I mean, the company, Adam Newman left, the company scaled back all these other crazy businesses, you know, ancillary businesses that had nothing to do with real estate, like wave pools and an education arm, um, school, the schools that they had. So now it's, it's run by a veteran of the real estate industry. It's very respected it's a real estate company. They're doing their an original core business. Um, it could be really, I mean, they've gotten out of leases, scaled back. Um, I think it's early to tell, but it, it, I think it makes a lot of sense in this environment. If, you know, sort of, we're all going to be going into the office, just maybe just a couple of days a week, if big companies cut their real estate footprint, and then just decide to have some people in WeWorks. I mean, there's, there's a world in which this model could make a lot of sense um and just everyone's going to be able to buy it on the stock market um very soon in the next few weeks because they've uh through a spac they're going they've gone they're in the process of going public and we'll actually start trading pretty soon so uh there'll be a stock to watch of how it's playing out yeah i i, I don't disagree much i i think it is it's generally uh 
a business, like the problem with WeWork was never the, the basic business model. People have done that for a long time as we sort of document in the book. Um, it's, it was the valuation. Now, the question for WeWork that makes it life hard is, is the, the, this like COVID is dragging on a lot longer than I think they expected a number of months ago. And the office market, uh, if, if it keeps dragging on, like, I mean, that's, it's just, you know, you're going to need a lot less space. And so all rents are going to go down and that affects them. They're stuck with these leases that are, you know, pegged from, from uh, a while ago when rents were much higher. Uh, so uh, they've got a lot of headwinds, we, you know, but I, I just don't think we know enough yet to know uh, how eager people are going to be going to go back to the office. If it were going to continue like it is today, I, th I think they'd have to go bankrupt. Like, like they, they just keep losing money. Uh, but, it, you know, it's, it's at least trending in the right direction. And, and there's reason to think it can, it can sort of accelerate and might even be a really good thing, depending how many people go back to the office. And do you think it's a, even a little different for them because the, the it seems to me COVID puts a damper on the idea of the social office, right? This, this was everybody playing games together and stuff. And, and maybe that's not what we want coming out of the pandemic. Yeah, it's an, it's an interesting point. That, I mean, that, the, yeah, the highly social. And then also, I mean, the other part of the model, it, which theoretically could have made sense, but you know, they never got there was um, just the density that was part of it. You know, you rent a, a floor of office space for a certain number. You pack people in very, uh, in very close quarters, but make it beautiful. And you have glass walls separating everything. But you get a lot of, you charge a lot of rent per person. And I mean, again, that's something like, yeah, you do not want to be close to your, uh, <laughs> on the many levels, the coworkers or non coworkers. So a couple of questions in the audience um, about uh, Adam. Um, one about uh, asking about his background, um, university degrees, uh, and the other that uh, is understanding uh, um, that he escaped relatively unscathed and with quite a bit of money. Um, is that true? And how is that possible? Um, yeah, I guess let's take them in reverse. So the uh, as as one venture capitalist who read the book put it, he's like, oh, it's like Theranos, except instead of him ending up on trial, he's a billionaire. Uh, <laughs> so I, I think that's the short version. He managed to get a uh, you know sort of both at the end of 2019 and then re renegotiating it over time after a court fight. He left with um, you know an exit package that that is essentially one of the largest golden parachutes to leave a, a, a your own company on Earth. Um, and so you can measure it in a bunch of different ways. But he basically got a, a couple two to three hundred million dollars in 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 cash and uh, stock, and then. Uh, the rest, he was able to sell a bunch of stock. So he left with over a billion dollars, uh, just sort of the stuff he took and then ha had take, sold hundreds of millions of dollars earlier. Uh, and and um, yeah, I mean, if you take a, all the amount he, he sold between him and his co-founder uh, and, and sort of the stuff he has left, he's, it was over $2 billion, I think. Um, uh, which is, you know, that's just the power of negotiation. I, like it, it kept, that's one of those things that surprised us again and again is even after WeWork was, was sort of down and I was on the brink of, of sort of failing, he said, I'm not going anywhere and you can let the company fail unless you give me like more money. Um, and and it, that that worked. Um, and then, yeah, maybe Maureen, you do want to handle the, uh, the early, you know, his, his college and, and early life part. Yeah, I mean, his background's fascinating. Um, he he was born in Israel. Um, he came, he lived in the United States a little bit, but um, after spending time in the Israeli Navy, he came to the U.S. in his 20s, and um, he went to Baruch College in New York for a while, but dropped out because he had this uh, brilliant business that he was totally passionate about, which was uh, selling baby clothes with knee pads so the babies wouldn't uh, hurt their knees when they crawled. It was called Crawlers with a K. Um, and it was funny to even talk to people that knew Crawlers or knew him then. Um, they were just like, okay, the business made no sense, but if he told you about it and you stood around him, um, you'd be like, okay, maybe this will be like the next biggest business ever. Um, <laughs> 
<laughs> so yeah, he was out of college. I mean, there's just so many, there's so many amazing things about him personally. I mean, he's just, it, English obviously wasn't his first language. He was, you know, uh, he learned it later in life for, um, but he's dyslexic. So he could barely type out an email. He could barely use a computer. Um, he could barely read. Um, yet, you know, no one could give a better speech than him. I mean, he's, you know, his mind is absolutely, he's a brilliant, absolutely brilliant person, but kind of a different, you know, how it, it manifested is it, just, it's really interesting. Um, his, you know, his powers and all those ways. And yeah, just to think, I mean, we, the irony always of like, he, he runs this real estate company that he's saying is a tech company and he knows how to speak the language so brilliantly to the top minds in tech or the top investors in tech, but can't even use a computer and can barely like use technology. <laughs> and and he's got a new gig going, right? Is he, he's trying to do it again? <laughs> he, so he's, he's done a few investments here and there. He, he keeps telling people he wants to do something big. I mean, the last thing we heard, this isn't super up to date, but didn't, it hasn't taken off yet, is, is doing something huge in, in residential real estate uh, and sort of the future of living. Um, yeah, you know, there's some basic problems. They tried to do that a little at WeWork. There's some basic problems with that model. Whereas WeWork, it was like, well, normally you can fit this many people on an office floor, but we're going to fit, you know, three times as many onto the same floor and get more revenue as a result. You try to do that with housing and it's like you run into tenement laws because everyone's so crowded and, and, you know, you want more than a hundred square feet for your, your, your one bedroom apartment. So, um, you know, it, 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 that's going to be a problem, but he hasn't, I, I think the, the short version is he wants to do something big. He keeps trying to invest in things. Um, if he has a brilliant master plan to get there, uh, we don't know about it yet. Um, but, uh, he definitely is, is itching to have a comeback. Um, okay, Maureen, a question to you about the Chronicle um, and, and um, whether the Chronicle helped jumpstart your journalism career. Um, I think, so I was worked on the Chronicle much more my freshman and sophomore year than I went abroad and did, a, did less. So um, I think the Chronicle is like the, basically the most amazing training ground imaginable for a journalist. So if it, it, you know, I don't think it helped jumpstart it, but it gave me some baseline. But I think once I was getting into journalism professionally, I like wished I wrote more my junior and senior year because I really think, I mean, it's, it's such a professionally run organization um, that I think it, 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 had I even, had I done it more, it would have been even better. I mean, it's, it's an, like the most amazing training ground you could imagine. Okay, um, a, 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 a faculty question. The whole MO of companies that aren't tech companies trying to, position, um, trying to position themselves as tech companies has been so common across so many different industry sectors over the past decade and a half. Are, are the days of the market and the media falling for this over? No. <laughs> um, Why yeah. not? <laughs> uh, this is Maureen's heard me complain about this a lot. Um, I, I think that, you know, if you look at the, the, the electric car startup sector, uh, you just see some really wacky things where these companies are getting valued like software companies uh, and, you know, need to build a car every time they need to sell it. And a lot of them haven't even started building cars and they're valued like, you know, there's two companies that are valued certainly one, maybe two that are valued more than Ford that, that haven't had a quarter of sales here. Um, see a, a cat show in the background. Um, <laughs> um, so yeah, the, the, I, I don't know. I, I think that we, we gravitate to uh, vision and, and vision really sells. And, and you, you talk about the future and it's a lot easier to, to sort of grasp that than it is the sort of, well, what if this doesn't happen? Um, ca counter arguments. I mean, I think um, Elliot and I personally could probably come up with a pretty good list of like all the red flags we would see in the next company. It's like the private jet, <laughs> 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 the private jet really early, like that's pretty, I mean, they're pretty obvious ones. 
you take out a lot of money before everyone else. That is like not a good sign. Um, I don't know what else. there's just like a litany of things. You, I felt like there's like even just turnover in employees um, in, you know, just very rapid turnover in some of these companies that are like visionary and going to change the world. But I don't know. Yeah, yeah, you can see it a lot in these CEOs who like there's some that are like really focused on the company and then others that you can see just love the fundraising game and and sort of almost like see their business as raising more money at higher valuations, uh, which doesn't maybe it generally does end well, but um, yeah, at least can end poorly. <laughs> and love themselves and lo like the whole like their whole story is such a part of it in, in a, like a weird way. Um, an interesting question. Um, so uh, the question is, he can't be the first rich guy to hide, hide drugs on a plane. So who, who were his handlers? Um, and was, was he such a narcissist that he was oblivious to the risks and wouldn't listen to them? Or did he, he obviously didn't hide it from them. Um, and also how much cover did he get from Masha Oshi's son? Um, I think he was, I, I think there was some sort of like ego or like he was nothing ever took him down before. So he, I think he, there's a level of like invincibility that he had more and more and more. And to the Masa part, uh, Masa Yoshison, Masa as he's called, is, um, it wasn't even cover. It was just so much more money being thrown at him. And at a moment in time, it was that he was going to help him stay private forever. And Masa just believed in him endlessly. So he just had more money to throw at his jets and everything else. But I mean, the other thing about whether it's like pot smoking or drinking um, is that, I mean, he didn't, he didn't really hide it that much from people. I mean, he would have um, maybe, maybe smoking a bit and drugs, but um, you know, he would have people in for tequila shots at 10 a.m. And, you know, it was somewhat performative, but um, he, I mean, there was one, one investor I heard went in at 10 a.m. and Adam, uh, the high level investor, Adam offered tequila shots and he left saying like, this is a red flag. I don't want to invest in this company. But for like one of this person, there were like dozens of others who didn't blink or thought it was charming and like, you know, he was a little crazy and that was cool and good, a good thing. And he, he would leave a trail of his sort of grandiosity around the, the company too. Like, I mean, I talked to like literally three people who worked on the air vent he had installed in his office to remove the marijuana smoke. Uh, and, you know, it's like you had a huge chunk of staff working on these things. And, you know, there's another anecdote we have of, of the uh, there were the CFO and then like a top political aide were tasked with um, working in the year of the IPO of, of, of removing a 5G antenna from across from their house because Rebecca Newman was worried about the effects on kids. Uh, and, and, you know, this is, that's not stuff a CEO should be doing on the company dollar, but, um, he just didn't think twice about it. And the same reason with why he sort of, you know, leased properties to the company. And no one pushed back on it. Right. But isn't there an element too of eccentricity is sort of, uh, um, uh, makes, I don't know, elevates your your standing. Um, it's, a, it's sort of a Steve Jobs thing. I'm sure it started long before Steve Jobs, right? Um, but the peculiarities about Steve Jobs made him seem more like a genius somehow. Completely. And I mean, he, I think he just was eccentric and crazy, but it, um, it worked to his advantage and in every different way. Yeah. To be seen as like a genius and a visionary. And that's what investors wanted and he fit that bill and um yeah i don't know it's it's interesting how um that played out oh i was just gonna say that um a banker was saying that they went to his office and you know adam is like rolling around and like they're all in suits visiting him and he's like walking around in a t-shirt and ripped jeans and his wife's in the next room his kids are sort of crawling all over him in the middle of this meeting and he was like, basically, he's who we all wanted to be. Like, 
we all thought we were like, you know, we're the lame men in suits and he's like the coolest guy ever. We just, we want to be Adam Newman. So. Mm. So, so one more question, um, sort of along the same lines, but um, uh, um, audience members curious um, what you thought of his, some of his other ideas, um, like We Live and the, the school that uh, Rebecca Newman proposed. Uh, I'll, I'll briefly circle back on we live to, to just like they it was not a money making proposition. Um, I think the the concept we live is basically just we'll have dorms for adults. Uh, but for, for the reason I was outlining where like you can't have the same density that you have in an office in an apartment building. So then any landlord would be like, well, why do I have to build this? Why wouldn't I just build an, a, a normal apartment building and take why would I take the risk with this other thing uh, if it's not going to generate more money? Um, and then the other thing is you can't just reconfigure an apartment, existing apartment building to be dorm like you would have to physically rebuild it, which is extremely expensive and time consuming. And so that's sort of hard for the venture backed model. But yeah, Maureen, do you want to talk about We Grow? Yeah, We Grow, I think, you know, both there are just a lot of things wrong with it potentially. But I mean, I think uh Adam Newman's wife, Rebecca, it was like her project inside the company and they were going to, you know, revolutionize education. And they, I mean, she was, it was a compelling proposition. They were going to rethink early childhood education and uh, elementary school education. And I think they're like amazing people were brought in and inspired by her vision, but it became, you know, just kind of petty. She changed her mind all the time on things. And I do think there is something, you know, we're seeing now in so many different ways that education in particular, there like a lot of, uh, whether it's in the nonprofit sector or in this case, it was for profit. It's like, wow, we can, we know educate, you know, we've made billions of dollars. We can rethink education and get it right immediately. And just time. And so that, in that case, it's not just the Newman's it's, uh, and we've seen it in so many different instances that, um, suddenly people who have made it in tech think they, or whatever else, think they know better than professionals in education. And, you know, if we just, if we start this new school, we'll, we'll totally get it right. And I don't think we, we have yet to see any of these experiments work on a, a really grand scale or even small scale in, a, in an amazing way yet. Great. Okay. Uh, before we wrap up tonight, I am excited to announce the lucky winners of our raffle prizes. Uh, a copy of The Cult of We hardcover and $50 to the Chronicle store. So can we get a drum roll, please? And the lucky winners are Karen King and Benjamin Chipman. So congratulations, and um, I think they will reach out to you um, with your uh, with your winnings. Um, and with that, um, there we are. Um, I'd really, I'd, this has been fantastic. I want to thank you guys. Um, you you have have enlightened us. You have entertained us. Um, you, your reporting on this story is important and impactful and um, really um, amazing. Uh, and so thank you so much for tonight's conversation. Um, you, can, you can screen, uh, I'm sorry, you can stream tonight's conversation along with 50 plus episodes of Demon Live at dukedemon.com. Um, make sure to follow The Chronicle on social media and dukechronicle.com. And you can learn more about the DeWitt Wallace Center for Media and Democracy, Duke's hub for journalism and media studies by following them on Twitter. And it's at Duke underscore DeWitt. So thanks again for joining us tonight. Um, and until we meet again, stay safe and well. Thanks very much, everyone. Thanks so much.